You might be an atheist. You might never step foot in a church. You might indulge in a few pagan rituals, maybe you even identify as a Jedi Knight. But if you live in the West, in much of Europe or North America or Australia, you don't know the world apart from Christianity. It's the water you swim in. It's the air you breathe. That's the main point of Glenn Scrivener's new book, The Air We Breathe, how we all came to believe in freedom, kindness, progress, and equality. Published by The Good Book Company. Glenn is an ordained Church of England minister and evangelist who preaches Christ through writing, speaking, and online media. And I'd like to note he's our third Australian guest so far in this season of Gospel Bound. He writes this in The Air We Breathe. The extraordinary impact of Christianity is seen in the fact that you don't notice it. You already hold particularly Christian-ish views, and the fact that you think of these values as natural, obvious, or universal shows how profoundly the Christian revolution has shaped you. Uh, As an example, let's just think of the cross. You might see it as a symbol of power or an oasis of relief amid crisis. A national flag, perhaps. But, of course, it's originally a subversive artistic appropriation, at the very least. In fact, to identify this crucified man as God is the most revolutionary notion the world has ever entertained. Glenn argues, what would a Roman, breathing Roman air, kept in check by Roman brutalities, raised on Roman myths, make of the Christian claim? They would, of course, consider Christ an ass, his worshippers fools, and his religion a perversity. Well, on that note, Glenn joins me on Gospel Bound to discuss the patriarchy, consent, Christianity for weirdos, and more. Glenn, thanks for joining me on Gospel Bound. Thank you so much for having me. Basic question here to start off, what's the most memorable thing you learned while writing this book? I think probably researching uh, the consent chapter. So I I talk about seven different values that constitute the air that we breathe. I talk about equality, compassion, consent, enlightenment, science, freedom, and progress. Um, But in especially reading Kyle Harper's work, uh, his book, From Shame to Sin, um, was really eye-opening for me in terms of, of seeing the ultimate sexual revolution not being the 1960s but but happening about 1900 years earlier than that and this this idea of equalizing the sexes is what holds common between the the sexual revolution of the 1960s and the sexual revolution of the first century Uh, but whereas the sexual revolution of the 1960s was saying to women you can now be as liberated as men always have been um, the first century sexual liberation, really, or the se- sexual revolution was saying to men, you must be as restricted as women have always been. And learning between Kyle Harper and between uh, Joseph Henrik, um, neither of whom I, I, don't, I don't think are Christians, but he wrote a book called The Weirdest People in the World. And, uh, and, and he just says that the modern world has been built from the marriage and family program of Jesus. And that restriction of male sexuality uh, has been absolutely for the blessing of the world. And to learn those truths um, from those who um, would not identify as Christians uh, was was kind of news to me. And it's been a real blessing to me in thinking through how do you navigate the the modern age of uh, sexual rights and sexuality and that that sort of thing. So I think probably researching the the consent chapter was the the big learning for me. Yeah, you cited I think two of the most important um, books uh, for for me working on this podcast, as well as for any of you out there who who love listening every week. Um, this is an interesting uh, observation, and I think it requires some some clarification. Uh, Glenn, explain what you mean that our problems with Christianity come from Christianity. Well, if you just reverse the seven values that I just mentioned in terms of equality, consent, and compassion, enlightenment, science, freedom, and progress, um, you get something that is unequal, cruel, coercive, unenlightened, anti-science, restrictive, and regressive. When I describe anything in those terms, you think of them as, that is the worst. (laughs) That that is... uh, and, and yet, the, there's a number of ironies about that. The first irony is this is the way most people consider Christianity <laughs> these days. 
<laughs> and then the the irony on top of the irony is we would only consider um, Christianity to be problematic in those terms because it has first given us those positive values. So, it, in a sense, I'm kind of making a kind of a presuppositional argument from a, an historical perspective, and and just wh whereas the presuppositionalist is is more concerned with sort of laws of logic and metaphysics and epistemology, I'm more concerned with the historical development of moral values. But with both, you're saying to people who have a problem with Christianity, by what standard? By, by what standard are you making your complaint um, against Christianity? And when people have a moral complaint against Christianity, it is almost always uh, because they are holding it to some kind of Christian-ish standard. And you have to ask, where have you gotten that standard from? And I make the case in, in the book that it's from the historical development of the Jesus movement. Now, uh, maybe the, the most provocative way to ask this ne next question is to say, how do Aesop's fables go over today? Um, but another way is, um, is I mean, the broader question is to say, how did the classical world view justice? Yes, very important. I, I think of a parable like the Good Samaritan, which historian Tom Holland has, has called the most influential short story in history, and I, and I agree. When you tell the, the story of the Good Samaritan, you have a man who is left for dead, and if nature takes its course, he will be overcome. And perhaps an Aesop's fable telling of that story would be, foolish man, he should not have been walking that road at that time. What did he expect? And yet the most influential and disruptive um, and revolutionary short story that there has ever been says, um, may maybe all of that is true, and yet there is a beautiful stranger. And the beautiful stranger, the Good Samaritan, is is not like the law. Because I think the best that the natural world, the best that the classical world can expect um, is for certain members of society to maintain standards. And that's what the Levite and the priest were doing. They were maintaining standards and they were doing what was right uh, according to a kind of a, a legalistic interpretation of, of the rules. What you get, though, with the Good Samaritan is intervention. And this, this is highly disruptive to a, a classical mind. You, you, you would have someone like a, a, an Aristotle or a Plato thinking of justice and, and, and writing politics, you know, and write, writing works of moral philosophy and political philosophy that are absolutely about justice, but justice is enforcing the natural inequalities that exist um, and, and they exist for a reason, and to live in tune with reason is to honor those inequalities. And if that man is dying, we let him die. There is an interventionist ethic in the Good Samaritan that comes along and, and says, we are, we are going to turn death into life. We are going to turn calamity into restoration. So I think I think burst out of the Jesus movement, you get a very different sense of what justice is. For for an Aristotle or a Plato, absolutely, nature intends inequality, and and the, you know, some it's so interesting. Modern modern people look at Aristotle and Plato, and they say things like they defended slavery, which is absurd because nobody was attacking slavery. Um, they didn't defend it; they assumed it. They spoke of certain classes of people as obviously being unfit for ruling themselves. And they said, when you look at nature, there are, there are, there are those who rule and the, the, there are those who should be ruled. And one of Aristotle's causes of just war was you could, you could go to the barbarian nations and it is just for you to take barbarians as slaves. That is, you know, that is just because nature teaches you inequality and we must enforce the inequality that is, that is there. A, a Christian understanding of justice is the, the overturning of those kinds of inequalities and the preservation of the weak and the poor and the marginalized and those left by the roadside, when actually pre-Christian and non-Christian cultures let people bleed out on the road because who knows, the village might have wanted him dead or the gods might have wanted him dead. Who are you to intervene? 
And I think we're in an interesting stage these days where a lot of people are outraged by the thought of an interventionist God. I don't believe in an interventionist God, you know, sings Nick Cave. Um, and yet, we do believe in humanitarian intervention, don't we? We do, we do believe in the Good Samaritan coming along and reversing the way of nature and, and bringing about a compassionate world rather than the, the nature that is red in tooth and claw. Um, and so, yes, the ancient world was very interested in justice, which is why one of my, uh, my, none of my chapters are entitled Justice because everybody wants justice. <laughs> And the, but the type, but what does the word mean? Does the word mean the enforcement of what nature has intended? Or does it mean an intervention from beyond, a gracious interruption that, that brings about the reversal of calamity and death? Under the Christian revolution, justice starts to be that. And so justice starts to be lifting up the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized, which is a totally different understanding of justice than anything that, that Plato or Aristotle kind of spoke of. So, yes, Aesop's fables teach a kind of justice, as, as do the, the classical philosophers. But um, the kind of justice Jesus speaks of is absolutely revolutionary. Now, I think you've probably g given already a, an excellent answer to this question, but I want to see if you want to expand on it. What difference does your book make for someone who you know, don't read the latest apologetic works? They don't really even know at all how to talk with non-Christian friends, family, or coworkers. I have lots of friends who don't think that they are believers. And I think of a, a friend who wrote me a letter and, and said, um, of course you realize I could never share your faith. And the, the way they said that was just um, so revealing to me about the way they conceived of faith and reason and whether they could ever conceive of themselves as being a believer, and they absolutely could not. And yet, this person um, has spent different years of their life um, in some of the poorest parts of the world, serving, considering themselves absolutely a humanitarian, um, believing in humanism, and believing in all the, the values that I, I, I put across in this book in terms of equality and consent and compassion and all the rest of it. And what do you notice about all those values? None of them can be proved. None of them are the punchline to a philosophical argument. None of them are the result of, of logic or scientific experiments. They are all faith positions. And my friend lives by those faith positions in a costly way. My friend ventures out into the world, not treating everyone they come across as though they're mischievous little apes, but as though they're, they are people of immense dignity and worth. Um, my, my friend is always going on about how society should look after the weak, the poor and the marginalized, and that society should be judged by how it handles the weakest members. All of these are very profound faith positions that as the book says, don't make sense apart from the Jesus revolution. And so, in step one of a conversation with your friends who do not consider themselves to be believers, I think it's really, it's really significant and it's really helpful to be able to say, um, you do have beliefs and let's pull at the thread of that belief because I think on the other end of that thread, there is a man you really ought to get to know. Well, I think there's a step there in the middle as well of showing that these things that you love, in fact, are not possible without that man. Not just that he sort of explains it, but that he is the entire fulfillment of it, and a world without him will not necessarily hold to these faith commitments any longer. Here's a, another topic, very, I mean, this is very current right now, uh, Christianity widespread belief across much of the West that it's a cruel purveyor of patriarchy. But I'm pretty confused about this, Glenn, and you've already alluded to this. Pre-Christian ancients would have choked on the idea of male and female as equal. You referenced Cal Harper's work in that first sexual revolution. How did we get to this point where Christianity is seen as being the regressive force against women when this 
history tells an entirely different story. Well, I, I guess what we've done with so many of these values is to secularize them, to depersonalize them, to take the Christ out of them and to take them out of their gospel narrative. And so, for instance, the first um, value, equality, what happens when you divorce it entirely from the scriptural story? I think one of the very... Um, uh, one of the very Western directions we've taken the truth of equality towards is an individualism. Whereas in the Bible, um, Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave and free are all one in Christ Jesus. Um, we have, in secularizing that truth, come to the view that all these people in their different social s statuses are individuals and therefore they ought to be equally high up their own individual ladders as opposed to equally welcome around the same table. And the individualism that has kind of grown up from that has taken us in a certain direction. And then you think about the, the value of compassion. Um, Christ has taught the world about servant leadership and Christ has taught the world um, about the value and the dignity of the victim. One of the ways, though, we have secularized that truth and taken Christ out of it um, has been not so much to honor and prize and help the victim as to race to become the victim. And so sociologists will talk about competitive victimhood and that sort of thing. Um, and then the, the third value that I, I speak of is um, consent in uh, and especially in, in the sexual realm. Now, where in the Christian story, consent is part of a very rich theology of gender and sexuality and marriage and children and family. Um, we have taken the consent thing and kind of elevated it to be almost the defining ethic when it comes to, to sexuality. And therefore, my sovereign choice in all matters sexual becomes... Well, it, it, it becomes the ultimate. And in a world that lacks a sense of transcendence, um, it, it is almost the, the most transcendent truth about me that I get to choose my own sexuality. So now we've got a heady brew. Let's, let, let's put those three truths back together. And we've got individualists who are competing over becoming the victims in, in, in certain areas of, of, uh, of social life and whose one sexual ethic is I get to sovereignly decide who I am. And with a cachet to, to sort of victimhood status, I, I think you combine all those things and you, you, get to the, you get to the modern world. Now, is, is the modern world with its very individualistic kind of um, and very fractured sense of sexual identities, is that um, a Christian world no, in, in so many senses, it's, it's a post-Christian world, um, but it is also inexplicable without um, the raw ingredients that Christianity has, has given to the world. So I, I sort of trace that out in, in, the, in the book, that w when I say that everything has been kind of Christianized and there are so many Christian-ish values out there in the world, um, that is not to say that anyone who um, makes any claims these days is making a, an essentially Christian claim, because so many claims in the West today are anti-Christian, and yet even in their anti-Christianity, they cannot help but bear witness to the original. Couldn't put a finer point on it, Glenn. Why, why couldn't consent fill the gap? <clears throat> you know, we've lost Christian ethics. Okay, thank you. We moved past that. Now we have the idea of consent. We've secularized it. We've universalized it. That's our ethic now. Go. Mm. What an unfulfilling kind of thing. Uh, did you read in uh, Vice of all places, there was an article that came out a, a couple of weeks ago in Vice magazine um, called um, Radical Monogamy. And have you heard about this incredible thing called Radical Monogamy? And uh, spoiler alert, it's monogamy. Um, <laughs> it's 
but but it has become this sort of niche interest in those who have tried everything else and now people want to get back to you know what i'm going to give myself utterly to my partner and essentially in in my sexual relationship i am saying the, the the very essence of marriage vows all that i am i give to you all that i have i share with you um and people in the article are sort of saying what makes us radical is that we are choosing um, this radical monogamy and and uh, and you don't know whether to laugh or cry but th they are also putting their finger on just how radical monogamy is the way that jesus kind of has has given it to the world and what i really want to do in the book is take people back two thousand years and figure out if you're wearing you know if you're wearing sandals in the first century and you're hearing the Jesus revolution as applies to sexuality, you're, you're actually encountering the most romantic vision for sex and marriage the world has ever seen. Um, in which, what? As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, um, the, the wife's body belongs to the husband. And everybody in the ancient world says, yes, absolutely. You know, nothing, nothing surprising there. And then Paul absolutely reverses it. And says, and the husband's body belongs to the wife. And like, what? Wow. So that actually where consent has come from has been a covenant relationship in of, of utter self-giving in which what you do with your body is also what you are doing with your life. Um, and one of the one of the spin-offs of of that covenant relationship is we we speak now much more of the autonomy and the rights of especially women who who had not had such rights but to to focus on that when actually what you've got is the covenant relationship of self-giving love um is is really you know to to, to sell your birthright for for, for a mess of, of pottage you know um yeah i, I Consent all by itself just leaves me all by myself with my sovereign choosing will. Um, consent as the scriptures give it is the mutual belongingness of people to one another, which is a, re a rich and relational truth. Uh, and I think that's what we're made for. We're talking with Glenn Scrivener uh, about his book, The Air We Breathe, How We All Came to Believe in Freedom, Kindness, Progress, and Equality. It's new out from the good book company um what do you mean glenn when you encourage the church to embrace its weirdness i think there's a danger that if i'm saying that the world has become christian ish the danger is i'll be heard to be say to be saying therefore the church should be world ish and i'm saying the very opposite actually um the jesus revolution has been so disruptive, so radical, and the ways in which it has shaped the world ha have always been because it has been different. If you think of, in the consent chapter, I, I talk about how pederasty, for instance, was just this, this very celebrated practice. And literally the word means child love, where an older male would initiate younger, usually boys, into um, sexual activities. Christians came along and, and Jews were saying this too. This is not pederasty. This is pedophoria. This is child destruction. Um, and they created a category for child abuse that, as Kyle Harper says, w was just invisible to the ancient world. But it did so by being very, very different and speaking out on matters sexual. Um, when there started to be laws in the Christianized Roman Empire, that said you must raise your own children and therefore laws against uh, exposure exposing exposing infants infanticide that was because christians had st stood against this basically it's a human universal really i mean i mean tacitus does talk about some germanic tribes that were so odd that they did not practice infanticide it was it was so notable to tacitus that there, there were these odd germanic tribes um so I, I won't say it's an absolute human universal infanticide but it pretty much it has been and christians and jews were always standing against it it was by being odd that they actually brought about revolution ending the gladiatorial games i mean the the, the story of telemachus the the monk um 
you know, in, in around about 400 AD, he, he goes into the arena to stop a fight between two gladiators and he gets stoned to death by the crowd. So clearly it's, it's not popular to take the stand that he took, but, but news of Telemachus's, you know, sacrifice reaches the, the ears of the emperor and he sort of legislates against the, the, the blood sports. Um, and so the, the ways in which the revolution has happened have, have been by Christians being weird, by Christians being against or Christians being a counterculture, not just doing what the world does, uh, but with a Christian spin. We, we are the, the, the origins, you know, the origins of the culture ought to be where Christians follow their radical Lord in radical ways. And the world is the one that is meant to be catching, playing catch up to us. So I end, I end the book um, by saying, yes, the West is weird. If you know Joseph Henrik's uh, acronym, Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic. Um, but Christians are the ones that are meant to be really weird. Uh, in following Jesus in radical ways. Well, let's let's give some examples. Who do you see doing this well? Um, anyone around the world that you see making disciples, especially among the unchurched and uh, the de-churched? Because I love I love your book, I love your videos, I love uh, I love your perspective that you're sharing here in this interview. And just give me examples of people that you see doing this doing this well out there in the masses. You know. I- Although it's a book of cultural analysis, I think the places I see this happening the most are in unsung church plants among people who, who, who do not have their finger on the pulse of cultural trends. I, I think of a church planting friend who has, you know, given up uh, very prestigious positions in flagship churches that everybody has heard of. Um, and has gone to you know start a church in a fruit and vegetable shop <laughs> in the north of England, and going from there to plant another church to plant another church, and has seen literally thousands of people come to Christ in the in the last sort of fifteen years, among the least and the last and the lost, and and I think maybe maybe one of the maybe one of the places where we can learn from history is actually in the grassroots nature of the Jesus revolution. Jesus began in Luke chapter four, preaching good news to the poor. And, you know, it, it, I mean, I'm in two minds, even as I answer your question, Colin, because I've, I've, I've written a book that is spotting intellectual trends. And yet I think, one of the trends <laughs> that that is being spotted here is that the Jesus movement works among the poor and the weak and the marginalized. Um, and so I, I hope that my book is never mistaken for uh, an academic argument that I hope triple, trickles down to the little people. <laughs> I hope it's never seen as that um, because it is the movement of a carpenter turned preacher who was crucified as a slave and his movement has world domination today but it has world domination never forgetting um the ways in which it has spread and i think i think it has i've, I've just done an, uh, a um debate with bart ehrman who um he's written a book about the triumph of christianity and in in his book he doesn't have any space for the growth of christianity via women, slaves, and children, which, um, and being particularly attractive to women, slaves, and children. He just says it's because they made miracle claims and people believed them. And yet I think there were, there were sneering critics of Christianity that were saying, you know, like people like Celsus in the second century saying it is women, slaves, and, and, and children who are flocking to Christianity. And I think that always has been the attractive thing about Jesus. So as you asked, you know, for, for modern examples, it, it will be not in the cultural centers, not, not Washington, Washington DC and Westminster and London. Um, it'll be the global Christian movements whereby by the end of this decade, if, if it hasn't happened already by the end of this decade, there will in all likelihood be more Christians in China than there are in the USA. This, this is where the movement is really gripping and, and overturning the world. Tell me a little bit more about that debate with Airmen. 
What were some of your uh, impressions walking away? I didn't know it was going to be with him. It was I. Um, <laughs> Wait, so Justin, you debated Bart Ehrman <laughs> and didn't know you were going to be. <laughs> Basically, with well, within within twenty four hours beforehand, I knew it was oh, Professor oh, Bart Ehrman. Oh, that's Ehrman. fun! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it turned out that he he is um, he is doing a debate um, uh, with Mike Lacona, and he okay. he really wanted to promote his debate with Mike Lacona, and so he was just taking it every request going, and of course he's never heard of me, um, but that that's you know that's the one thing I've got going for me. I'm, I'm nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I, you know, I went into that debate, and I, w- what I found interesting is that he agreed on the compassion thing. He said, absolutely, Christianity uniquely brought um, service to the world. When the, when the rest of the world is talking about dominance, Jesus came preaching service. And the fact that we now think of that as a virtue and not a weakness is definitely down to the Jesus revolution. Um, so that was an interesting point, p- part of uh, kind of common ground that we had. The, the other reflection I had was that he kind of brought out, brought up equality of the sexes in, in our debate, and um, which is like equality of the sexes is an implication of some of the things that I'm talking about in the book, but it's, it's not something that I, I, I address fully in the book. But I, I think people can make their, their own minds up as they see the debate. But I I think it demonstrates that even criticisms of Christianity end up having to assume Christian values. Um, I I, I do think that as as he is seeking to criticize Christianity, he is criticizing it for being unequal and coercive and cruel and regressive and anti-science and unenlightened and all all the kind of brickbats that he threw at at, at Christianity um, were really the reverse of the seven values of my book. Um, so people, people can have a look at that um, for themselves and, and see. But, but I, I do think it was an example of Christianity being so immense that even our problems with Christianity have been given to us by Christianity. Do you see, Glenn, any reason for hope for a widespread return to a recognition of these Christian values coming from Christianity or to vibrant Christian faith itself? anywhere coming soon in the West or you basically just foresee continued marginalization and hey, that's okay because the center of gravity has shifted to the global South and East. Uh, yeah, the center of gravity um, has shifted and that's, that's a good thing. Um, I don't, I don't want to see a return of values in, in, in a sense, I, I mentioned in the book that um, to have a, a restoration of values is to leave us in a, um, a, a very vitriolic and volatile state. Um, Spurgeon said, if you, if you have but half a Christianity, you're the most miserable creature on, on earth. Um, and he was talking about individuals, but I, I think that's also true about society. I think to have a semi-Christianity is almost the worst of all worlds, because if we're all holding each other to these Christian-ish standards of compassion and consent and equality and all these sorts of things, and we've divorced it from the narrative in which it makes sense, then we've got some, we've got some high octane um, values to to kind of to wield and to and to, we you know I, I often say the culture wars are, uh, are just we're hurling Bible verses at each other. We've forgotten the references, but that doesn't matter. We're, we're just we're just going to take each other down, um, and without without knowing the Christ who embodies those values and the Savior who forgives us when we fail at those values. There's such a lack of dearth of forgiveness, especially in the culture wars. Um, so, we, we, we must not simply agitate for a return to Christian values. I, th- <laughs> I think, in a sense, you know, Dostoevsky said, uh, um, without God's everything is permitted. I think what we're noticing in the, in the early 21st century is that without God, everything is preachy, really, really <laughs> preachy f- in a fiery kind of a sense. And it's, uh, and it's not much fun. So, but I do have hope that we can grasp the person of Jesus again and have ac- actual spiritual revival. And one of the things that made me most hopeful was um, reading accounts of the times when the tide was out in terms of Christian influence in the world. Um, Tides go in, 
and tides go out again. And uh, th there's a there's a hilarious chapter of Rodney Stark's book, the the Triumph of Christianity, where he just collates together. All the, all the biggest horror stories of how dreadful the clergy were during the Middle Ages. And like every now and again, the bishop would kind of summon everybody to church on a Sunday and then realize what an absolute mistake that was. Because there are just <laughs> women in the front row dropping their babies because they've fallen asleep. And there's a dog fight breaking out at the back. And people are, it's an absolute zoo. And then the bishop basically bans them from coming to church the next week. And and all the, and as woeful as all that is, you sort of think, you know, it is not the case that everything was hunky dory until the nineteen fifties. And then we just went into this nosedive. It it has been the tide has been going in, the tide has been coming out, and and that's that that is the way of all these things. And, you know, I I, I finish with a mention of of Jordan Peterson, who is just an interesting figure. Um, I don't make any claims um, for him being on the Christian side. And I don't make any claims for me being on his side or whatever whatever side <laughs> um, might be might be kind of emerging as he processes things. But he he is an interesting figure of someone noticing that the values we've inherited are uniquely Christian and unlosably so, and him spiritually wrestling with that. Where that will take him, I don't know, but I do know that there have been a lot of people leapfrogging him into the kingdom um, and, and coming to faith in the Christ figure who he speaks of, and they've come to know him for the, for the person who he really is. So might that be a way into faith? I don't know. Certainly the fracturing of society and these, these culture wars that are just killing us are making us long for a person <laughs> above and beyond the values and, and forgiveness beneath the, the values. And certainly in the, the conversions that I'm seeing, I'm seeing people come to faith in very um in ways that are surprising me in in ways that i would not have foreseen 10 years ago people just picking up the bible and just reading it and falling in love with jesus and and they might end up in an orthodox church or they might end up in a catholic church they might end up in an anglican church or a baptist church and and you know there'll, there'll be a lot of discipleship issues <laughs> for people but there's such a hunger and and why not? You know, the, the church has been in a lot worse state than this before revivals have broken out. In fact, a problem with the church is a necessary prerequisite for revival. <laughs> you don't have revival unless you have something that needs to be revived. Um, I think you probably covered this with, with Harper and with Henrik, but if someone wanted to go deeper, Glenn, on the topics that you've covered in your book, what three books or authors should they should they pick up? I really liked Larry Seidentop's Inventing the Individual. Um, so he wrote that in about 2014. Um, and he came at it from just a, an academic perspective, figuring out where our modern notions of rights and equality and individualism um, have have come from. And he gave me a, a he gave me quite a deep appreciation for the ancient world and how ancients saw things. I mean, my, my first degree was was really in philosophy, and I, I did study quite a lot of Plato and Aristotle and that sort of thing. But but I think setting it in its social context was really important um, for me. So Larry Seidentop's book um, is great. Um, Tom Holland's book, Dominion. So I've, um, I've gotten to chat to him a, a few times, and uh, he's come on our uh, YouTube channel a couple of times. Um, I... I think it's beautifully written as uh, a history of the last two and a half thousand years. And I think he's come to an interesting place where he recognizes that we've got a pale imitation of Christianity with modern secular liberal values. It's a pale imitation of the Christian things. And he's basically like, I've given up on the pale imitation and I'm surrendering to the story. I don't know what that means <laughs> for him. I think he's figuring out what that means for him as well. Um, so, but beautifully, absolutely beautifully written, um, Dominion. And I'd, I'd recommend that for, for people. What would be another good one? I think, um, you know, Vishal Mangalwadi, um, wrote a really interesting book back in 2011. Um, I might 
point people to, to his book, The Book That Made Your World, um, where he takes things thematically. Or David Bentley Hart's Atheist Delusions, the, uh, oh, what's the subtitle? It's brilliant. It's the, um, the Christian Revolution and Its Fashionable Enemies. Um, because David Bentley Hart cannot write an uninteresting sentence, um, <laughs> even a subclause. But um, yeah, that's actually, yeah, the Atheist Delusions is fascinating. Or oh, Bull Bullies and Saints by John Dixon. That would be another great one. That's just come out. Um, I, I think he, I think, yeah, he does a great job as well. Several of those we've covered here on Gospel Bound and encourage people to go back and listen to those interviews as well. Um, Glenn, let's do a final three with you here. We'll do these rapid fire. How do you find calm in the storm? There's one verse that calms my heart. Um, I know Tim Keller talks about, you know, there are some verses or there's like some illustrations or stories that have a radioactive power um, to do something to your soul. And... Matthew 18, verse 3, is that for me. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom. And I quote that to myself probably every day, probably at the, at the start of every prayer time. I just, I need to remember that I am not a busy soldier coming to my commanding officer. I'm a child coming before a generous father who knows how to give good gifts to his children. And I think coming to enjoy God, um, you know, I'm, I'm from a kind of a tradition that always speaks about having a quiet time and temperamentally that does not work for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't understand quiet times. I always, I always think it's, it's hilarious, isn't it? At the beginning of 1 Samuel, when Hannah is praying before the Lord and her lips are moving, but nothing is coming out. And Eli just, he just assumes she's drunk. Like, who prays silently? <laughs> who does that? <laughs> Only a drunk person would pray silently. Um, it, it might be part of that hyper-individualism that, uh, that I've been talking about, <laughs> that sort of Western, uh, yeah, overextension of the, of the individual type thing. So I, I, need to, I need to pray out loud. I need, and I need to not think of it as a quiet time, but as a time to enjoy God. Enjoy the Father in the Son. The, pr the high priesthood of Christ is absolutely central to my spirituality, really. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. And, and again, I quote that to myself. I have to quote that to myself because I've got monkey mind and I'll be all over the place. That's again why I can't be silent or I, I'll just be all over the place. But taking my soul in hand and... and in the name of Jesus, coming to a father as a child. Um, it's got to be that, or the busyness just gets me. Where do you find good news today, Glenn? I talked to my friend who's planted all these churches and, and yeah. seeing <laughs> so much fruit around the place. The, the other day, he emailed me, and he, his, his sign-off, he, literally his sign-off was, I think it's the most exciting time to be in church ministry since the 12th century. <laughs> that's just... That's just <laughs> What was it about the 12th century? I'm trying to think. I, know, I, I hope it wasn't the Crusades. That's, that's all I'm hoping. I was going to say, <laughs> we've, got a, <laughs> we've got a Bernard. We've got a Bernard of Clairvaux. Yeah, yeah unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, a saint turned bully. No. Um, knowing him, it's, pro it's, it's probably, you know, the, the Ethiopian Coptic church and the way it reached out to the Taiwanese or something. Like, like his, his knowledge of but I guess that's a silly example. But in, in one sense, it, it's like I find good news by just friendships are just utterly crucial, aren't they? Um, and especially in, in an age when your friendship has been commodified by Facebook and uh, and just and turned into a a posture that you hold publicly towards the world, actually actually having a a private category for friends who absolutely know you, get you, um, and and speak gospel good news to you. So, like "Life Together" by uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I just I just love the line where he says that the the Christ in the word of a brother is stronger than the Christ of your own heart. 
And what he means is, you know, you can nurse a sense of the goodness of Jesus in your own heart. Sure. You can encourage yourself about Jesus. Sure. But when a brother or sister eyeballs you and says, Glenn, the son of God loved you and gave himself for you. Um, that is, that is good news. I, I've got, I've got some good Lutheran friends who are very much about extra nos, the, the, the outside of ourselves. Um, and they're, and they're very good at demonstrating their belief in the external righteousness of Christ just declared to you, idiot sinner that you are. Um, so I find, I find good news in, in friends who know me, who know what a fool I am and who, who declare that good news to me anyway. Last one, Glenn, what's the last great book you've read? I should have read this, um, I should have read this while I was researching the book, and I don't know why I didn't, but Christian Smith's Atheist Overreach, um, it's just a, a lovely, crisp kind of philosophical unpacking of some of the things that I, that I sort of researched for the book. Um, and it, 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 in a sense, he's, he's a much gentler guide to this, and he's a, he's, he's a Christian guide to things on, on the other side of the coin to Nietzsche. <laughs> you, could, you could go to Nietzsche, and Nietzsche will teach you that um, it's Jesus who is responsible for your belief in compassion and humanitarian ideals. Nietzsche can teach you that in his way, <laughs> but Christian Smith is just, a, there's a real um, concision, there's a real clarity of, of insight and expression there's a kind of a, a, a crystal clarity to, to christian smith's writing that i um is lovely and, and understated um which which appeals to me because i'm i'm the other way you know i, I just like on the, the the cover of my book the very first word is punchy you know and that's like <laughs> <laughs> i'm pugnacious and, and and christian christian smith you know knows knows how to sort of slip the knife in without you even noticing. Um, so, yeah, Atheist Overreach by Christian Smith. He saved the pugnaciousness for writing against Protestants. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, my guest um, on Gospel Bound this week, uh, somebody I've wanted to, to feature for a long time, uh, Glenn Scrivener. And go ahead and check out his book, The Air We Breathe, How We All Came to Believe in Freedom, Kindness, Progress, and Equality. Published by The Good Book Company. Glenn, thanks so much. Colin, thanks for having me. 